Hi, and welcome back to my videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the last video, we started looking at solutions, and we focused on solutions consisting of two liquids. But some interesting things happen when we have a solid or gas dissolved in a liquid. For one thing, as we've mentioned before, it's possible to dissolve so much solute in our solution that we end up with a saturated solution. Let's look at that process of dissolving a solute in a solvent a bit more closely. So, what determines how much of a compound we can dissolve before it becomes saturated? Well, it depends on a couple of things. One is the temperature. Usually, more solute can dissolve when we raise the temperature. You're already familiar with this one. If you try to dissolve sugar in cold iced tea, you'll find that it's much harder to do than if you try it when the tea is hot or at room temperature. Another way we can change how soluble something is, is by changing the pressure. This is true for solids, but it's especially easy to see when we try to dissolve a gas in our solvent. For instance, when we have a bottle of soda, you know that it has carbon dioxide dissolved in it. Here's an unopened bottle. It looks like plain water. There's no evidence of any gas in it. That's because right now, there's a fairly high pressure, much more than one atmosphere, in the bottle above the liquid. When I unscrew the cap, I release all that pressure. Now the pressure above the liquid is lower, it's just the same as the pressure in the room. As a result, the carbon dioxide in the soda isn't as soluble in the water, and it doesn't stay dissolved anymore. Another place where this effect is important is when you're scuba diving. Deep underwater, the pressure you experience is very high. So just like the gas in the water bottle, the amount of gas that can dissolve in your blood under that pressure is higher than usual. If you then come to the surface of the water, the pressure outside your body is much lower, and that means the extra gas in your blood won't be as soluble anymore, and it'll escape to form bubbles. That can be very dangerous, and it can cause pain, dizziness, and loss of vision. To prevent that from happening, it's important to come to the surface slowly so that the excess gas has a chance to escape without forming bubbles. The person who figured out the connection between the solubility of a gas and the pressure of the liquid was William Henry, and the relationship he discovered is named Henry's Law after him. Here it is. This tells us that the solubility of a gas is equal to a constant times the pressure. The solubility is just the concentration of the gas that we can dissolve in the liquid, which we usually measure in molarity, and the pressure is measured in atmospheres. The constant is called the Henry's Law constant, and it's different for every combination of solvent and the gas you're trying to dissolve in it. There's a table of these in our textbook. You'll be given them when you need them on a test or on the homework, so you won't need to memorize these. Let's try an example. Suppose we can dissolve 5.89 grams of acetylene, which is C2H2, in 250 milliliters of acetone at 0 0.870 atmospheres. What will be the Henry's Law constant? In this case, we're going to figure out KH instead of looking it up on a table. In order to do that, we'll need to know the solubility, S, and the pressure, P. P is easy. We were given that in the question, but we'll need to calculate S. Remember, S is measured in molarity, so we need to know the moles of gas and the liters of solution. We'll use the periodic table to find the moles of acetylene. When we do, we find out we have 0 0.226 moles. For the liters of solution, we'll use the volume of acetone, which is 0 0.250 liters. This is a little bit of an approximation, because the volume will increase a little when we dissolve the acetylene in it but the difference will be very small, so it's still about 250 milliliters. This gives us a solubility of 0 0.905 molar, so we'll use that for S in the equation for Henry's Law. Now we can calculate the Henry's Law constant, which turns out to be 1.04 molar per atmosphere. Now that we know the Henry's Law constant, we can use it to predict the solubility of acetylene in acetone for any pressure. For example, suppose we raise the pressure of acetylene above the solution to 12.0 atmospheres. What will be the solubility of the acetylene now? 
we'll use Henry's law again to solve this one. This time, we're trying to find the solubility, so that's our unknown. We figured out the Henry's law constant in the last problem, and found out that it's 1.04 molars per atmosphere, and our pressure is 12.0 atmospheres. When we solve the equation, we find out that the new solubility is 12.48 molar. William Henry is also remembered for another reason nowadays. He was very interested in the behavior of gases, which is what led him to develop the law that's named after him. But he also used his expertise to discover new ways to use gases for heating and lighting. In fact, the very first street lights in England were created using his inventions in Manchester, where he was a professor. You can still see one of his street lights there today. The solubility of gases and liquids still has important consequences now, in addition to making carbonated sodas more fun to drink. Remember, I told you that the solubility of a gas depends on the temperature. That fact led to a terrible disaster in 1986 at Lake Nyos in the West African country of Cameroon. Lake Nyos is a very deep lake atop an extinct volcano. But even though the volcano is extinct, it still leaks carbon dioxide into the bottom of the lake. Because the lake is so deep, the top of the lake is noticeably warmer than the bottom. That means that the top of the lake contained more dissolved CO2 than the bottom did. Unfortunately, that had a serious consequence on August 21st of that year, when a landslide occurred. That disruption caused the CO2 in the lake to suddenly bubble out of the water, just like shaking a bottle of soda causes it to fizz. As a result, about 300,000 tons of CO2 were released from the lake in a huge cloud. Since CO2 is heavier than air, it crept along the ground and eventually covered an area with a radius of 16 miles. You can't breathe carbon dioxide, so many people and animals caught in the cloud of gas suffocated and died. Over 1,700 people and 3,600 livestock animals died because of the CO2. Since that happened, scientists have set up equipment to prevent too much carbon dioxide from building up in the lake. This photo shows the result. A system of tubes carries the gas away from the depths of the lake. Once the pressure builds, the gas gets released through the tube, taking some of the lake water with it to create a fountain. Next, I want to talk to you about why some liquids, like acetone and alcohol, evaporate so quickly. You've probably noticed this if you've ever spilled any on a dry surface. The liquid evaporates very quickly, much more quickly than water would. In order to explain that, we'll use lots of ideas we covered in the previous video, so if you haven't watched that one, you might want to do that now. As you know, solutions contain a solvent and one or more solutes. It turns out that many properties of the solution depend on exactly how much solute is dissolved in the solution. So, for example, a saturated salt solution will act very differently than one with just a little salt in it. So in other words, the behavior of the solution depends on the concentration, and that's why we spent so much time learning about concentration units in the last video. We're going to use that information now. The properties of a solution that depend on the amount of solute are called colligative properties. There are four of them, vapor pressure lowering, freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, and osmotic pressure. We'll talk about each of them in this video in the next two. For the rest of this video, I want to focus on that first one, vapor pressure lowering. You've probably seen water and other liquids evaporate many times. The liquid slowly forms a gas and floats away. We also saw liquids become a gas when we talked about phase diagrams and heating curves, but that was a very different kind of phenomenon. In that case, we heated the liquid until it got so hot it reached a boiling point, and then it vaporized. That's not what happens to a liquid when it evaporates. The temperature might not be anywhere near the boiling point, so if it never gets hot, how can the liquid become a gas? The key is to remember what happens when we have a huge collection of molecules. Here's a picture of a bunch of molecules in a container. They're color-coded by their speed. The red ones are the fastest, and the blue ones are slower. As you can see, they're not all moving at the same speed. There are always a few that are going very fast. 
As you might remember from your General Chemistry 1 course, that's one thing that makes a liquid different from a gas. In a gas, the molecules are moving much faster. So just like in this picture, in a liquid, a few of those molecules will have a much higher speed than the others, and if they're going fast enough, they'll be able to escape the liquid and become gas molecules. It's the intermolecular forces between molecules that make them stick together and stay in the liquid phase. In order to become a gas, the molecules have to be moving fast enough to escape those intermolecular forces. And there are always a few molecules that happen to be moving that fast by pure chance, even if the temperature is way below the boiling point. That means liquid molecules are constantly escaping to become gases, and that's what happens when a liquid evaporates. But think about what that means for a second. Because molecules are constantly escaping from the surface of the liquid, that means there's always a small amount of gas above the liquid surface. This is called the vapor pressure, and every liquid always has a vapor pressure above it. For example, at 25 degrees Celsius, water has a vapor pressure of 23.76 millimeters of mercury. So that means that if we have a beaker of water in a room where the pressure is one atmosphere, or 760 millimeters of mercury, 23.76 millimeters of that is due to water above the beaker and the other 736.24 millimeters is because of the other gases in the air. Molecules are always escaping from the surface of a liquid. But so far, we've only been thinking about a pure liquid like water. Now let's imagine what happens when we add a solute to the liquid. When we do that, there aren't as many solvent molecules at the surface of the liquid. That means not as many solvent molecules can escape from the surface, so the vapor pressure of the solvent will go down. And that's all there is to it. The more solute we dissolve in our solution, the fewer the number of solvent molecules that will be at the surface, and the lower the vapor pressure will be. This phenomenon is called vapor pressure lowering, and it's one of those colligative properties I listed earlier. Remember, a colligative property is one that depends on the concentration. Here's an equation that we can use to determine the vapor pressure. We'll call the solvent A. PA is the vapor pressure of the solution, and this is the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. You might recognize this symbol as the mole fraction, which we learned about in the last video. So XA is the mole fraction of the solvent. Notice that this equation makes a lot of sense. Suppose half the molecules in our solution are solute molecules. In that case, half of the surface of the liquid would be blocked by the solute, so only half the usual number of solvent molecules would be able to escape the surface. That means the vapor pressure would only be half of what it would be if there were no solute. That's exactly what this equation is showing us. If half the molecules were solute and half were solvent, then Xa, the mole fraction, would be 0.5, and that means the vapor pressure on the left would be just half of the vapor pressure of pure solvent. Let's try an example. Suppose we add 65.0 grams of glucose to 150 milliliters of water at 25 degrees Celsius. What will be the vapor pressure above the solution? To find out, we'll use our equation. We need the vapor pressure of the pure solvent which is water. We can get that from Appendix B in our textbook. As we saw earlier, it's 23.76 milliliters of mercury. We also need the mole fraction of water. We talked about that in the previous video. It's the moles of water divided by the total moles of all the ingredients. In this case, that's glucose and water. So we have 150 milliliters of water. Since the density of water is about 1 gram per milliliter, this is 150 grams. Using the periodic table, we find out that that's equal to 8.33 moles. Meanwhile, we have 65.0 grams of glucose, which has the formula C6H12O6. Using the periodic table, we find out that that's 0.361 moles. If we plug these into our formula for the mole fraction, we get 0 
Now we can use that in our equation for the vapor pressure, and we get 22.77 millimeters of mercury for our vapor pressure. So that's the vapor pressure of the water above our solution. It's a little lower than it would have been for pure water. Notice that we needed the mole fraction of the solvent, water, not the glucose. That's because the vapor pressure we're calculating is the vapor pressure for the water. Also, notice that it didn't really matter that the solute was glucose. Our solution had 0.361 moles of glucose, but we would have gotten the same result if it had been 0.361 moles of sucrose, or codeine, or another solute. That's because all that matters is how much of the solute we have. In other words, how many moles not what the solute actually is. That'll be true for all of the colligative properties. It's not what the solute is, it's the amount of solute that's important. Well, that's enough new material for now. When we meet again, we'll look at more consequences of this equation, which is known as Raut's Law, after its creator, the French chemist Francois-Marie Raut. We'll see that understanding the implications of Raut's law can help us perform better and more effective distillations, something that could be a big help in your future organic chemistry experiments. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.